armor of truth live. Faith is resistance. everybody. Welcome. It's good to see you out there. I can see you. And uh, welcome to the show. Today we're going to go into our new Bible study series. Just like that. Welcome, my friends. This is part one. Of a, of a series that's going to go for a while. The way this is going to work is we're going to... We're going to answer some questions about who is this person, Jesus. Because people are going to be asking you. There's a lot of curiosity in the world today about who is Jesus? What are these Christians? Because we... Just by being faithful, we're starting to make waves. We don't need to rebel. We're not called into rebellion. Just follow Jesus and you will be the resistance today, that's for sure. But who is that Jesus? That's what we want to answer. Okay. And uh, this is going to be a, obviously a multi-part series. I'm not sure how many parts it's going to be yet. But today we're going to start out with uh, answering some Probably some questions you've had or you, someone you, you've heard ask you a question about Jesus. What, what, who is he? Fully God, fully man? What is this? Is, is it true? Is he real? Is there any evidence? So we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing a Bible study, an, expo, an, an expository Bible study. We're going to be going through the Gospel of John in this series. Now, that means that today we're only going to go through the prologue of John. That means the, uh, verse, or verses 1 through 18, Gospel of John, verses 1 through 18. We're going to start out with that. And then we're going to uh, understand uh, Christology. What is Christology? Christology. And why should you know what it is? And why should you have one? And there's going to be some important terms that come up today. We're going to learn some things. And let's see, we've got uh, almost 30 people here now. So I want to let you guys know that we're going to be, we're going to be giving away one of these books today. 
thanks to christianbook.com for making this available to give away. We've got a couple of these. Today we're going to be giving away one. You remember this. We did the Bible study series, remember? Are you ready for battle? So they sent us a couple of these to, uh, to give away. I'm going to be asking a question at the end of the stream today. A pop quiz. There's going to be a question at the end of the stream today. So you'll have to pay attention to the show to be able to answer the question. All right, so at the end, or very near the end, I'll ask you guys a question. And then the, the you'll, send your, uh, you'll send your responses in to... I'll just show you right here. You'll send your responses in to summer at armoroftruth.net. Not yet. Not yet, because you don't have the answer yet. But uh, I'll remind you of this when we get to the... To the end of the show. And that's where you're going to send your answer. So if you, if you, if you haven't attempted the answer, we, won't, we, we can't count you. right? So, so the, 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 the first person to answer the question correctly that I ask at the end, we haven't asked it yet, I'll ask it at the end. First person to answer that question correctly will win this. And we'll let you know. And we'll ask for your uh, mailing address, and we'll ship that out to you. Free, at our expense, but free to you. All right, so pay attention. Pay attention today. It's going to be a, a term. All right, you're going, to want to, you're going to want to know that term to answer the question. Okay, now, as we get started today, let's go ahead and jump in on these Bible studies. Sometimes they can go for a while. Those of you who've been around here, you know how it is. These live, this is more than a Bible study here. This is, this is a, a study on Jesus Christ. And it just, just so happens that we're going to use the Gospel of John also. All right, so as we start out today, we're going to be uh, in the Gospel of John. What's known as the prologue, the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. And I'm going to be reading that for you. You'll see on your screen there we have on the left is an English Standard Version translation. And just to the right of that we have the old King James translation. Uh, I'll be reading from the ESV, but I, I love the KJV as well. I keep it alongside all the time. But since we do have folks who do not have English as a first language, we use the English Standard Version, uh, mostly for the reading around here, but we definitely check in with the KJV. All right, so we're going to start off with the, with the prologue. That's going to be the first 18 verses, the Gospel of John. And that's, that's the, the scripture for this, for this study today. And then we're going to get into something called Christology. Christology. And why is it important? Okay. So we start off this way. John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. Also, I'm, I'm just going to start with this, and then we're going to give you a background of the Gospel of John. So you'll know everything you ever wanted to know. Hopefully. That's our prayer anyway. And we do ask, as always, that those of you who are watching... Please pray for the one speaking here to you today that this would be not, not about me and my instinct or, or, or my desires, but this is just that, that God would work through me to make sure that you receive His message, His Word. Gospel of John, from the top. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through Him. 
He was not that light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. All right, so there you go. That's the, what's known as the prologue, the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. We have many resources to share. To share with you in this study, I'm going to share some uh, many commentaries. And now what we want to, to look at here, first of all, is this word, this term, the word. Right, right here from the beginning in, in uh, verse 1. Go. We see this term, the word. In Greek underlying Greek text there is, of course, logos. The expression, the word, here is a difficult one, and it's peculiar to this particular gospel. There's no clear proof, anyway, that it's used by any other New Testament writer. Not in this in this way. Uh, the texts in Acts 20, verse 32, and Hebrews 4, 12 are, to say the least, doubtful. But that it here signifies a person and not just a spoken word, and that it is applied to our Lord Jesus Christ is very clear after the first sentence. So sometimes you'll see, you'll, you'll hear the... The, uh, from those who reject the doctrine of the Trinity, which is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, first person, second person, third person of the Trinity, one being, only one God, three persons. Those who, will, who deny the Trinity will try to say that this word is just God's spoken word, that it's, but you'll see very clearly, it's very clearly Jesus. It's signified very clearly in the prologue here. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That it was a familiar term to the Jews is undeniable. But why this particular name is used by John, both here and in his other writings, is a point on which commentators have debated over time. This sentence means that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, was in nature, essence, and substance, God. And that as the Father is God, so also the Son is God. Doctrine of the Trinity. One being, one God. Now, of course, here we get a mention in the middle of this. We get a men uh, mention here of John the Baptist, verse 6. There was a... A striking description of John the Baptist. He was the messenger, the forerunner, he's been called, whom God promised to send before the Messiah. He was born when his parents were pretty old. 
And this was by God's miraculous interposition. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He received a special commission from God to preach the baptism of repentance and to proclaim the immediate coming of Christ. In short, he was specially raised up by God to prepare the way for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ. And for all these reasons, he is here called a man sent from God. Okay, now, once again, we go down to verse 14, and this, this word, this word, word, let's go down to uh, verse 14, and the word became flesh. Now, I've heard debates, I've even watched a few recently, where uh, you, you, those who would deny the Trinity and and they, and they call themselves Christians, you would call these folks, these are oneness. They're known as, it's a oneness type theology. And it, it must, it, it has to stand on the, one of the earliest Christian heresies known as modalism, that God just presents himself as Jesus or presents himself as the Holy Spirit. But as God, when God is presenting himself as Jesus, there is no Father and there is no Spirit. That's modalism. That, that God presents himself in one of three modes, but that's not what Scripture gives us. Here, in the first, in the prologue, in the Gospel of John, we see this very clearly. But this expression here, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The expression, the Word here, shows clearly that this Word, who was with God and was God, must be a person. Now, a person is attributes. A person, uh, it, well, it, let's just say this. It could not reasonably, reasonably be said of anyone but a person. This could only be talking about a person. And that he became flesh, and dwelt among us. So as you read, the, the, the reason that's so important to, to, to be clear about this is because if you only had one part of the Bible that you could hand to someone, kind of like this, you want to give them the Gospel of John, in my opinion. Especially those who might be, uh, who might be Muslims. There's a big move today uh, evangelizing Muslims. Muslims around the world are reporting meeting Jesus in dreams. Now, that's very interesting because they're having visions of Jesus in places where evangelism is not allowed. So you see, see how God gets it done? Okay, so now we've got a little, a little foundation to work from. It, it, who is Jesus now? Who is this word? If it is Jesus, then who is this? So, in order to do this properly, what we have to do is... We're going to build what's called a Christology, a Christology. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, what we want to have is a very high Christology. In other words, this means we're, we're going to grasp all we can know or as much as we can possibly find and, 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 and know. We won't get it all, but we're going to get a lot of it. We want to grasp as much as we possibly can about the Savior because what our aim is is to take the highest possible view of Jesus and His person and His work, who He was and what He did, who did He claim to be, and did He prove it. And so this is where we start. So, first of all, Christology, or your Christology. Why is it important? So this word, Christology, comes from two Greek words, meaning, first of all, Christ or Messiah, and word, ology, logos, again. And these combine to mean, essentially, just the study of Christ. Christology is the study of the person and work 
of Jesus Christ. And that is our purpose in this study, to build a high Christology. Now, in this process of understanding who Jesus is and to come away from this whole thing with a very high Christology, there are questions we want to answer. And we're going to get to many of these today. Who is Jesus Christ? Almost every religion teaches that he was a prophet or a good teacher or a godly man. But the problem is the Bible tells us that Jesus was infinitely more than a prophet. Much more than a good teacher. Even much more than a godly man. Next, is he God? Is Jesus God? Did he claim to be God? Now, he never uttered the words, I am God. It, uh, but he made many other statements that, can, that could not possibly be interpreted to mean anything other than, yes, he is. God in the flesh. Now, this brings up this technical term known as the hypostatic union. How can Jesus be both God and man at the same time? The Bible teaches that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine, that there is no mixture or, or uh, dilution of either nature, and that he is one united person forever. Now, we'll, we'll look at uh, hypostatic union in a little more depth in just a moment. Of course, we have to answer the question, why is the virgin birth so important? It's crucial biblical doctrine as it accounts for the for the circumvention of the transmission of the sin nature and allowed the eternal God to become a perfect man. So we'll look at that in depth in just a minute. Why, why a virgin birth? Why was that necessary? Also, we need to ask the question, what does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? We'll all be, also we'll be looking at the the, uh, the incarnation. Was Jesus God in the flesh? What is this deal about the Word and the Word made flesh? What does it mean that the Word became flesh, as we saw here in the prologue in the Gospel of John? What does that mean? Also, what does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? What does it mean when Jesus uses his favorite title for himself, Son of Man? What, what do these things mean? So an in-depth study of, a, of Christology, Christology, Christology has a huge impact on a Christian's life, on your daily life. So as we dive in to try to understand the heart of Jesus, we, we start to get a hold and to understand the amazing concept that He, being fully man and fully God, loves each of us with a, with a never-ending love which is impossible for us to truly grasp the depth of. The various titles and names of Christ in Scriptures give insight into who He is and how He relates to us. He is our good shepherd, leading, protecting, and caring for us as one of his own. He is the light of the world, illuminating our pathway through an often dark and uncertain world. He is the prince of peace, bringing tranquility to our crazy lives. And he is our rock, the immovable and secure foundation on who we can trust to keep us safe and secure in Him. All right, so that's what we're doing here. We're going to build a, an accurate and strong Christology. And that's how we're going to go about it today. Also, we're, we're going to look at some uh, objections to... 
to Jesus, uh, some modern objections uh, that you, you might have heard of uh, from three, uh, three groups out there, the, uh, one of them being the Jesus Seminar. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll, I'll share with you what Vody Bauckham's written about the Jesus Seminar and the new atheists and the, uh, this new perspective on Paul. There's a new perspective on Paul out there that maybe perhaps Paul was teaching a different religion. Is that true? Well, we'll, we'll see what, what's up with that. Uh, we'll, so you, because one of the things that we do here is I, it's, it's, it's very important to me because apologetics is really what brought me out and into doing this. It was, of course, God's guidance and the Holy Spirit that brought me into the faith. But one of the reasons I'm here doing this is because I think it's more important today than ever that you, you know what you believe and why you believe it. Or someone's going to come along and give you something to satisfy those things that may or may not be true. Most likely it won't be. So as we start building our Christology here, let's ask some questions. Is Jesus real? <laughs> Is Jesus real? Well, sim to answer that question simply, yes, Jesus is a real person. I didn't say was, did I? I said Jesus is a real person. Now, he is one of the most complicated, discussed, and revered historical figures of all time. Most scholars, Christian, non-Christian alike, um, even secular, I guess, believe that there was a historical Jesus. That's most. The evidence is overwhelming. Jesus was written about by ancient historians, including Josephus and Tacitus, not Christians. Uh, from a historical standpoint, there is hardly any question at all. There really was a man named Jesus who lived in first century Israel. Now, the Old Testament predicted the Messiah, a real person who would deliver Israel from their enemies. Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Born of the tribe, uh, the tribe of David, Genesis 49.10. He was to be a prophet similar to Moses, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. He was to be a herald of good news, Isaiah 61.1. He was to be a healer of illness, of, of maladies, Isaiah 35. The Messiah would be a godly servant who suffered before entering his glory. Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus Christ. It was all prophesied right there. So Jesus is the real person who really fulfilled these prophecies. Now, the New Testament contains hundreds of references to Jesus Christ as a real person. The earliest gospel may have been written even within 10 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. And the earliest of Paul's letters was written about 25 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, this is important because it means that as the gospels were circulating, there were plenty of eyewitnesses still alive who could verify the truth of the gospel accounts or or call them out as being fake. But that didn't happen. The manuscript evidence, which we've covered here in the past. Some of you who are a little newer, you may, maybe you haven't seen that presentation yet of where we go through and just show how, what an embarrassment of riches we have when it comes to evidence for our, our, our Bible being transmitted accurately, fully, and that those documents are pure. So the manuscript evidence is what we're talking about. For the authenticity of the New Testament is overwhelming. There are about 25,000 early manuscripts of the New Testament. In comparison, something like uh, the Gaelic Wars written by Caesar in the first century B.C. only has 10 early manuscripts existing, but no one questions its authenticity. And the earliest one of those was written a thousand years after the original. We have manuscript copies. Uh, now, there are no originals in manuscript copies. There are no originals that are known of anyway now, but we have manuscript copies that are 
from within the same generation, from as close as 10 years. Some, but the, some of the manuscript copies of other historical, uh, of, of other historians, are, uh, there's separation of a thousand years from the original to this first manuscript copy they have, and no one questions it. But when it comes to the Bible, people love to question it. They think they can knock it down with that argument, but that doesn't work. Similarly, Aristotle's Poetics only has five early manuscripts in existence. I remind you, I just said 25,000 manuscripts for the, for the New Testament. And uh, Aristotle's Poetics, the manuscript, the, early, the manuscript copy they have available, dates to 1,400 years after the original. So those who doubt that Jesus was real must also question the existence of Julius Caesar or Aristotle or, or, any el or anyone else from the period. Now, Okay, that's inside the Bible. What about outside the Bible? Jesus is mentioned in the Quran and in the writings of Judaism, in the writings of Gnosticism, in the writings of Hinduism. Early historians considered Jesus to be real. The first century Roman historian Tacitus mentioned the followers of Christ. Flavius Josephus, an ancient Jewish historian, refers to Christ in his Antiquities of the Jews. Other references to Jesus exist in the writings of Suetonius, uh, chief secretary to, uh, to Emperor Hadrian, uh, Julius Africanus, quoting the historian Thallus, Lucian of Semosata, a second century Greek writer, and Pliny the Younger and Mara Barserapion. No other historical figure has had as much impact on the world as Jesus Christ, whether uh, one uses likes to use BC before Christ or BCE, which is common now. People say before the Common Era. Doesn't matter. The whole Western dating system is measured from one event: the birth of Jesus. You can call it the Common Era if you like, but everyone knows why the calendar changed. And that event was the birth of Jesus, a real person. In the name of Jesus have been founded countless orphanages, hospitals, clinics, schools, universities, homeless shelters, emergency relief agencies, and other charitable organizations. Millions of people can give personal testimonies of Jesus' continuing work in their own lives. So there is overwhelming evidence that Jesus is real both in secular and biblical history. But maybe the greatest evidence that Jesus existed and that he did what the Bible says he did is the testimony of the early church. Literally thousands of people, followers of Christ in the first century, including the 12 apostles, were willing to give their lives as martyrs for the gospel of Jesus Christ. People will die for what they believe to be true, but no one would be willing to die for a lie. No one in their right mind. So we're called to have faith, and faith is trust. So it's not a blind faith. It's not, it's not blind faith in some kind of make-believe story, but a genuine faith and trust in a real person who lived in a real place and a real time in history. This man who proved his, divi his divine origin through the signs and the miracles he performed and the prophecies he fulfilled died a horrible and humiliating death on a Roman cross, was buried in a Jewish tomb, and rose again on the third day for our justification for us. So Jesus is real. As you see in John chapter 20, verse 29, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. So our faith is not blind. We're rich with evidence. To be more specific for someone who might not know, Jesus was the founder of what we call today Christianity. It carries his name. It doesn't actually carry his name. It carries his title, which we'll talk about later. And this was approximately 2,000 years ago. Certainly the most influential person 
in history. Once again, the Bible claims that Jesus is God in the flesh, which you just read. Also, we see this in Colossians 2. Colossians 2, chapter 2, verse 9. Which says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Talking about Jesus. What we know about him is found mainly in the New Testament, particularly in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of course, there are critics who would say that Jesus never existed. And there are others who will say that the Gospel accounts are exaggerations and a myth. But the New Testament documents as we've stated and proven over and over here, are extremely reliable. More reliable than anything else you'll find from antiquity. And the book of Acts gives us a history of the early church. According to Scripture, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, who came to earth, born under the law, and was a proper sacrifice for our sins. This is why he needed to become a man. He was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, our earliest account of the, of the gospel. And as far as the important key events in Jesus' life, we'll be getting to that in, our, in the last segment of our show today. And that's a really interesting study. But unlike this question, does God exist? Very few people question whether Jesus Christ existed. It's generally accepted that he was truly a man who walked the earth. But you know what's interesting? Jesus Christ is a name that has power. You don't see people getting angry often at the names of Buddha, Muhammad, But the name of Jesus Christ has an effect on people. So is Jesus God? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus real? Who, who is Jesus? Is Jesus God? This is what we're going to be taking on now. The Incarnation. Was Jesus God in the flesh? We see here in the Gospel of John. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The term incarnate, incarnation, means to become flesh. It's got the word, carne, right in the middle of it, which means flesh. The Incarnation is that event where the second person of the Trinity, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, of course, Colossians 2, 9, For in Him dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. Another term for the Incarnation of God in reference to Jesus, is something we call the hypostatic union. What is hypostatic union? So I've got more. I've got more, more stuff to put on the chalkboard for you here. Okay, hypostatic union. This is an important... This is an important concept to understand because we it's a good question when you have it like what do you, how can he how can he be god and man and what did, what 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 does it mean that he died if he was god was that really some kind of a sacrifice we're going to answer that question for you how if jesus was eternal then how could he die you know we're going to get to that today as well but this hypostatic union this is a this is an important concept and term to understand. The two natures of Jesus, God and man, fully God and fully man. 
This is a biblical doctrine that in the one person of Jesus, there are two distinct natures, the divine and the human. Each nature retains its essence and attributes and were not lessened or changed in the person of Christ at the incarnation. Yet, there are not two persons, but one person who is Christ. The attributes of both natures were ascribed to the single person. This is called something called another technical term called the communicatio idiomatum. It means the communication of the attributes. Remember, a person is attributes. A person is not always necessarily a being. So Jesus, who had two natures, claimed the divine attributes when he said in John 17, 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. The glory which I had with you before the world was. John 17, 5. He claimed human attributes when he said, I am thirsty. John 19, 28. So we see that Jesus is both divine and human. He is divine so that he could offer a sacrifice of divine value. He is human so he could offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. And, of course, our scripture today, the first the prologue of the Gospel of John, Jesus is the Word made flesh. The Word was joined with humanity, Colossians 2, 9, once again, and Jesus' divine nature was not altered. So, this term, the hypostatic union, was canonized. I mean, it was taken in and, and made part of systematic theology uh, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. That doesn't mean they made it up at that council. That doesn't mean they found a name for the biblical doctrine. It's kind of how uh, also the, uh, the, the term Trinity came about. Uh, you don't find the term Trinity in, in the Bible, but it's clearly a doctrine taught there. And so this uh, similarly this happens similarly. Hypostatic, the word, as you see on your screen there, is a word derived from the Greek hypostasis and is translated as nature or substance. Or it could be foundation. And in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, We see this mentioned. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now that just means He took a position of power. It is translated as uh, image or imprint, depending on the translation that you have, the Bible translation you're using. And so Jesus is fully God and fully man. We see this in various verses. The verses that speak of him as being God. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Also, uh, Gospel of John Chapter 20, verse 28, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, which says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. So he was called John, I mean, he was called God in the Gospel of John. Chapter 20, verse 20, he was called the Son of God in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. He was prayed to in Acts chapter 7, verse 59. He was recognized as sinless in 1 Peter 2.22 and Hebrews 4.15. says he knows all things, the Gospel of John chapter 21. He gives eternal life, the Gospel of John chapter 10. And the fullness of deity dwells in him, which we just saw in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. And also, fully man. 
Gospel of John chapter 17, where he shows he worshiped the Father. He was called man in Mark 15 and John 19. He was called son of man. In John chapter 9, he prayed to the Father in chapter 17. He was tempted in Matthew chapter 4. He grew in wisdom, as we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. He died, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. He has a body of flesh and bones, Luke 24, 39. Fully God, fully man. The two don't intermix. He didn't lay down his divinity as some word of faith teachers will try to get you to believe. But that's the idea of the hypostatic union. Fully God and fully man. The two don't mix. He didn't lay it down. He didn't lay down his divinity. And this made him the perfect sacrifice, the final sacrifice. So he came into the world, incarnation. That's the, the word we're dealing with here. Once again, it just means to become flesh. The event, the incarnation, is when the second person of the Trinity, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 say, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He didn't lay it down. But he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, uh, I'll tell us by common confession, Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and then taken up in glory. Now, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So any of those religious sects out there who teach you that uh, Jesus was a spirit, that the resurrection was not a man, it was just some spirit, that spirit is not from God when they say that. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. John chapter 20, verse 28 says, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas, who had doubted, said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see him and touch him. He had that opportunity. And of course, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne... O oh God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of His kingdom. The Word became flesh. For some reason this term, the word logos, is used today in weird ways to mean, try to mean something. It's some philosophical machination, who, who knows. But the term Word, it's used in different ways in Scripture, but the, in the New Testament there are Two Greek words translated for word. It's rhema and logos. And they have slightly different meanings. Rhema usually means a spoken word. For example, in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 38, when the angel told Mary that she would be the mother of God's son, Mary replied, said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And that, that one, the underlying text is rhema there. Logos, however has a broader, more philosophical meaning. This is the term used in the prologue here to the Gospel of John. It usually implies a total message. I've given you the word, right? It's not just one little word. I've given you the word. You, you have understanding now. So it's usually meant in a more philosophical meaning. This is the term used in Gospel of John, it usually implies the total message. It's used mostly in reference to God's message for mankind. 
For example, in Luke chapter 4, verse 32, it says that when Jesus taught the people, they were amazed at his teaching because his words, logos, had authority. The people were amazed not merely by the particular words Jesus chose, but by his total message, his word. Now, this term in John chapter 1 here, the word, logos, is referring to Jesus. It can be no other. Jesus is the total message. He lived it out. Everything that God wants to communicate to man came through Christ. So you have to ask yourself the question, if God came into the world, how would he best communicate with his creation? The first chapter of John gives us a glimpse inside the father-son relationship before Jesus came to earth in human form. He pre-existed with the Father in verse 1. See there? He pre-existed with the Father in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is no separation. He was involved in the creation of everything. We see in verse 3, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Who's the Creator? Well, it's Jesus. It's the second person. And he is the light of all mankind, in verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now the word, meaning Jesus here, is the full embodiment of all that is God. And we see this in Colossians 1, 19, Colossians 2, 9, and Gospel of John chapter 14, verse 9. But God the Father is spirit. He is invisible to the human eye. It's very important to say it that way, isn't it? To make sure that people understand God is spirit. It's to be worshipped in spirit and truth. But God the Father is spirit. He is invisible to the human eye. At least as it stands right now. The message of love and redemption that God spoke through the prophets had gone unheeded for centuries. And people found it easy to disregard the message of an invisible God, as they said in uh, Athens there, the unknown God. And they continued in their sin and rebellion. So the message, the Word, became flesh, took on human form, and came to dwell among us. Now, the Greeks use this word logos to refer to one's mind. They use this term logos to refer to reason or wisdom. But John used this Greek concept to communicate the fact that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is the self-expression of God to the world. In the Old Testament, the word, the word of God brought the universe into existence. Remember? Let's look at that. Psalm 33. 33.6. Where we read this. By the word of the Lord, that is Yahweh, the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth, all their host. Who's the creator? And saved the needy, we saw in Psalm 107.20. And in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, John is appealing to both Jew and Gentile to receive the eternal Christ. Once again, folks, this is why it's crucial to understand the context of what you're reading. Who is John speaking to here? And why would he use a term like this? It must be that at the time it was written, it was very clear to those who were there. This is why it's most important for us when we read Scripture is to try to see it through the eyes of those who were there writing it, those who were there hearing it, read to them. First, that's first. And then try to make applications to your own life after that. But Jesus told a parable in Luke 20. 9 through 16, to explain why the Word had become flesh. He says, A man planted a vineyard, 
rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. So in this parable, Jesus was reminding the Jewish leaders that they had rejected the prophets and were now rejecting the very Son of God. The Logos, the Word of God, was now going to be offered to everyone. Not just the Jews. Because the Word became flesh, now we have a high priest who is able to empathize with our weaknesses. One who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not succumb. He didn't fall. He didn't sin. Which brings us around to that question, why virgin birth? So Jesus, God came into the world... But why was a virgin birth so important? Now, this is a clear biblical doctrine as well. It's debated, but it's crucially important. The doctrine of the virgin birth is seen in Isaiah chapter 7, Matthew 1, Luke 1. But let's look at how Scripture describes the event in response to Mary's question, how will this be in Luke 1, Gabriel, the angel, says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The angel encourages Joseph not to fear marrying Mary with these words. He says, What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.20 Matthew states that the virgin was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. That the virgin was... There's, there's no question was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 18. Galatians 4, 4 also teaches the virgin birth. It says God sent His Son born of a woman. So from these passages, it's obviously clear that Jesus' birth was the result of the Holy Spirit working within Mary's body. The immaterial, the Spirit, that without matter, the Spirit, and the material, Mary, Mary's womb, were both involved. Mary, of course, could not impregnate herself, and in that sense, she was simply a vessel. Only God could perform the miracle of the Incarnation. But denying a physical connection between Mary and Jesus would imply that Jesus was not truly human. But Scripture teaches that Jesus was fully human, with a physical body like ours. This he received from Mary. At the same time, Jesus was fully God with an eternal, sinless nature. This is in John chapter 1, verse 14, which we just saw. 1 Timothy 3, 16, Hebrews chapter 2. So Jesus was not born in sin. That is, he had no sin nature. Let's see from Hebrews 7. It would seem that the sin nature is passed down from generation to generation through the Father. Romans 5.12. We see this. So, the virgin birth circumvented this, went around this. It went around this transmission of the sin nature and allowed the eternal God to become a perfect man. So, why is it important? Why is the virgin birth important? Because this is the way... 
to avoid taking on the sin of Adam, which we all have because we're all born the same way. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, was born in a different way. A virgin birth without a human father. And therefore, the transmission of the sin nature was bypassed. Now, okay, so for a little bit of, you know, as we're talking about the virgin, we're talking about the birth and all this. Sometimes people say, well, on what day and month was Jesus born? So, you know, we want to know. I want a high Christ dodge. You want to be able to answer all these questions, but nobody knows for sure what, what month uh, obviously not which day Jesus was born. There's a lot of theories about it. Maybe it was March, April, could be October, September, but nobody knows for sure. Now, of course, December 25th, it's recognized uh, these days as a popular pagan holiday that dealt with the winter solstice, uh, which was the shortest day of the year and signaled the approaching of spring. But it was a day celebrated by many in the Roman Empire, in order to replace pagan practices, the early church adopted that day and celebrated it as Christ's birthday. But uh, we know that most probably it was not the correct day. How do we know this? Well, there are biblical clues about the time of Jesus' birth. Luke chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 say, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. So, so the time of Jesus' birth coincided with shepherds being out in the field. They would not have been out in the field during winter, so this removes the possibility of Christ's birth being at that time. Now in Luke chapter 2, we see, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while, Quirini while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David. So the trip from Galilee to Bethlehem is about 80 miles. During the winter, the traveling conditions would have been it wouldn't have been possible. It would have been very bad, which would have made it extremely difficult. And since Caesar Augustus wanted a census of the people, it would make more sense for him to require it during a time when people could return to their cities of origin to be counted. So different dates are proposed for Jesus' birth, but we have this biblical evidence. But since John was born on Passover, the 15th day of Nisan, the first Jewish month, Jesus would have been born six months later could be, on the 15th day of Tishri, the seventh Jewish month. So you can, you can make these assumptions. The 15th day of the seventh month begins the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot. And Jesus was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles in the year 5 B.C. This fell in the month of September. That's one theory. That's one theory. Don't know for sure, but that's one theory. Also, it's probable because of the circumstances shown in Luke 1 that Mary conceived during the last two weeks of Elizabeth's sixth month. So we do have this relationship to John the Baptist and Jesus being babies at the same time. Thus, John was born in the spring of 4 B.C., probably between March 18th and 31st. And by projecting forward another six months to Jesus' birth, the most probable time for his birth occurred between September 16th and 29th. So that's pretty interesting. That's another theory. And another theory would be from the 15th day of Nisan, John's birthday, we add six months to arrive at the 15th day of the seventh month of Tishri, uh, the first day of the festival, the festival or the festival. Theologians have also suggested that Jesus was born in the spring based on the biblical narrative that the shepherds were watching over their flocks in the fields on the night of his birth, something they would have done in the spring, not the winter. So these are, nobody knows. So I wanted to cover that one because sometimes people bring it up, you know, 
the idea of why do we celebrate Christmas on the 25th? Has someone co-opted it to make us all pagans? No. The Christians were well aware in the first century what went down on, on the winter solstice. And since they weren't, since they didn't have anything concrete and it probably didn't matter to them that much like it does to us. Hey, what's your birthday? That's something we you know, ask all the time. We're just, we're just kind of, we're just, kind of, we're just a little more selfish these days. We just want to keep up with those things. But there's another question that comes up, and it's a good one. Why was Jesus born a baby? Why was he not just created? Put into the world as a 30-year-old man, which is, you know, where we pick him up in the Gospel of John at his baptism. Well, why not? Why was, he, why was he not? Why didn't he just, why wasn't he created and have some kind of uh, massive descension into the earth where everyone, why not? Why was, you know, we just looked at the importance of the virgin birth. That was so that Jesus could, could uh, bypass taking on the sin nature that we all have from Adam. So he could come and, be, and, and represent the perfect sacrifice, the sinless nature. But the reason that Jesus was born as a baby and not made as a mature 30-year-old man is that in order for him to be the Messiah and fulfill prophecy, he needed to be born under the law, as Galatians 4.4 states that he was. Part of this requirement of the law was to be circumcised on the eighth day after being born. He could not do that if he was made at 30 years of age. There were rites of passage that he needed to come to to be born under the law. It means he was born under the Jewish law. Also, if he were not born, then Jesus would not be both divine and human. Hypostatic union. Because there would not be a true incarnation of the Word, which was God, and was made flesh in the one person of Jesus. Also, if he were made, just made to a 30-year-old man, presented to the world, he, then he would not really be 30 years old, would he? He would only appear to be 30 years of age. This is important because in order for a priest to be eligible for his priestly work, he has to be at least 30 years of age. And for this piece of evidence, we go to Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4, verse 3, where it says, well, let's go back to verse 2. Let's go all the way to the top. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, by their clans and their fathers' houses, from 30 years old up to 50 years old, all who can come on duty to do the work in the tent of meeting. You couldn't be a priest until you were 30 years old. So Jesus needed to be born under the law, go through these pass these rites of passage. He needed to be circumcised. He needed to be in subjection to his parents. And he needed to grow to the age of 30 before he would be eligible to become the high priest after the order of Melchizedek and thus perform the atoning work, which is what the high priest did at that time. And then Jesus replaced them all. So, interesting, right? Why, 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 why is 30 years old important? Why, why, why was Jesus, uh, why's the virgin birth important? Interesting questions. Another question that comes up is we seem to lose track of Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30 years of age. Um, we see, you know, we have the, the story of Jesus being born he grew in stature and wisdom. And we know that his uh, parents, uh, according to the Scripture, he was, he was left in the temple. He was in there. Had to be about my father's business, didn't you know, he said. So, and that's one of the last accounts we have of Jesus until 30 years old. So where was Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30? We don't get much in the New Testament uh, about these so-called missing years, but other than short mentions of 
Jesus being 12 years old and speaking with various Jews in the temple and amazing them. We see that in Luke chapter 2. But there's very little information about his childhood, his teen years and his 20s. But there are some apocryphal writings that try to bridge this gap in information such as the infancy, the infancy gospel of Thomas, etc. But these apocryphal works are written very late, way after the fact, 3rd, 4th, 5th century, and really are not regarded by even the most skeptical scholars as giving any sort of accurate portrayal of Jesus' life, his younger years. The best thing that we can say for now is that it was not the 1st century gospel writer's purpose to talk about the childhood years of Jesus in much detail. That's something we do. We like scrapbooks, don't we? That's kind of, remember, we, we like to put ourselves on pedestals now. That wasn't how they were really thinking. So we really don't have much to say about those, those years. But it's probably better if we should focus on what we can know about Jesus rather than what we don't know. Uh, for ancient historical records, we have a lot of information about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And those are the events that are important. And so it's on those events that we should focus since the resurrection is the foundation upon which our faith is built. And one more interesting question that comes up. Did he know he was God? When he was a little boy, did he know he was God? It's kind of an interesting question, isn't it? What do you do with that one? When did Jesus know he was God? The Bible doesn't, doesn't really tell us if or when he realized it, that he was God in the flesh. But we don't know if he always knew he was divine even in the womb, or if he just realized it later on. Each position has some difficulties. Each the positions that try to explain this have difficulties. After all, Jesus was born under the law, made under the law, and he cooperated with the limitations of being a man. He cooperated. He didn't lay his divinity down, but he cooperated with the limitations of being a man. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. So does this require that he also did not know who he was at birth? No, it doesn't. Did the divine nature go dormant when Jesus was a baby? If so, what would that even mean? But then again, the divine nature requires that he knows all things. But we see in the Gospels that Jesus, for example, did not know the day nor the hour of his return. So it seems like in this case, he's cooperating with the limitations of being a man since he was made under the law. This does not mean he did not know who he was in his divinity. Remember, he's, he's fulfilling the role of a high priest, which is the atonement for the sins of the nation. He's not there to tell them, to, to teach them, or, or, or to reveal to them those mysteries. He's there to perform the role of a high priest. Nevertheless, the earliest hint we have of Jesus being aware of who he was is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, where he and his parents were going to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And it says in verse 42 that he was 12 years old. On their return trip, he remained in Jerusalem while his parents and the large caravan returned home. Now they, this is not like they just neglected their son. They probably presumed he was with other extended family members. And when they discovered he was not with them, they simply returned to Jerusalem. And, and when they found him, Jesus said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? So you can say there for sure. He knew who he was at least by the age of 12, since he was calling God his own father. But again, since the scriptures don't give us enough information to, to answer the question definitively, we you just can't say when, when it was that Jesus came to know that he was God in the flesh. He's probably always knew that. But since we can't 
put a definitive point on it. So this is one of those things that we don't need to try to answer. Because if you do try to, you'll end up in error. And it's, once again, it's not one of the pieces that's most important. All right, but th so that was a little diversion, a few questions that come up. Then you talk to atheists or uh, people who deny that Jesus existed or, or want to debate it with you. Those questions come up quite a bit. So now we come to this... Uh, this piece now where titles, titles for Jesus. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? How can he be God if he's the Son of God, right? Or what does it mean that Jesus is the Son of Man? That's his favorite title for himself. If, if you were there and you got to meet Jesus and you asked him who he was, he would most likely answer you with that term. I'm the son of man. So what, are these, what do these titles mean? First of all, we have to understand Jesus is not God's son in the sense that we would think, in the sense of a human father and a son. These are... Once again, these are attributes, ways for us to get our mind around an eternal being, an uncreated, eternal creator. God did not get married and have a son. God did not mate with Mary and together with her produce a son. Jesus is God's son in the sense that he is God made manifest in human form. Jesus is God's Son in that He was conceived, once again, in Mary by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 35 declares it once again. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, during His trial before the Jewish leaders, the high priest demanded of Jesus... In Matthew 26, 63, he says, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he said to them, yes, it is as you say. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven, Matthew 26, 64. And the Jewish leaders in verse 65 and 66 responded by accusing Jesus of blasphemy. Now, later on, when he was with Pontius Pilate, the Jews insisted. They said, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God, John 19, 7. So why would his claiming to be the Son of God be considered blasphemy and be worthy of a death sentence? Well, the Jewish leaders understood exactly what Jesus meant by the phrase, Son of God. To be the Son of God is to be of the same nature, the same substance as God. So the Son of God is of God. The claim to be of the same nature, the same substance as God, to, is, is to, in fact, be God. This was blasphemy to the Jewish leaders. Therefore, they demanded Jesus' death in keeping with Levitical laws. And Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says it clearly. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Another example can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, where Judas is described as the son of perdition. Or you could call him the son of Satan. An antichrist. Small a, for sure. John chapter 6, verse 71 tells us that Judas was the son of Simon. So what does John 17, 12 mean by describing Judas as the son of perdition? The word perdition means destruction. It means ruin. And Judas was not the literal son of ruin or destruction and waste, but those things were the identity of Judas, of his life. In other words, Judas was the manifestation of ruin 
and destruction. In the same way, Jesus is the Son of God, the manifestation of God. The Son of God is God. Jesus is God made manifest. So I think we're doing a pretty good job of making the case of who Jesus is. First of all, is he God? Who did he claim to be? Now, but this, once again, this, are we going to get confused now? Because what was Jesus' favorite title for himself? Son of man. What gives, Jesus? Can you help us out with this? That was my prayer before we started, that these would all be very clear. So you could take this with you, and when people, people are going if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus today, and you're out here in this world, and you're, you know, and people know you're a Christian, which they better, they should. That that ought to be one of our goals is for people to know we're Christian. So if they do, there's a move today. There's a movement alive today, and it kind of got started several years ago with the apologetics movement. Everything was really. It was really uh, the debate between atheists and Christians. It all just ramped up and it became, and it's, it's sort of died down a little bit now, but as a result of that, there is a curiosity about who are Christians? Who are these people? People who don't understand Christians are, are starting to, under, to see clearly like that the Osteen crowd... Uh, there's some of these people are starting to understand that these are charlatans and not not to be that they're not actually Christians. So people want to know what is real Christianity? What is biblical Christianity? What is the truth is what people want to know today. There's a movement. So you're going to have an opportunity. Some are going to ridicule you for your beliefs, for your trust in Jesus and others today even right after they ridicule you or make fun of it, will probably get you. If they get you off just one-on-one, will ask you questions, sincere questions. Because it's, it's easy to, to mock and ridicule the person when you're in the group. Yeah, look at the silly Christian over there. Oh, all our friends. But when they get alone and you're one-on-one, you'll see, a different, you'll see a different attitude. So it's good that we, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, 15, that we... We'd be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in us. So, Son of God, we laid that one out. We fixed that one. But what about Son of Man? So, Jesus is referred to as Son of Man 88 times in the New Testament. In fact, of course, as we said, Son of Man is the primary title Jesus used when referring to Himself. The only use of Son of Man in a clear reference to Jesus spoken by someone other than Jesus comes from the lips of Stephen as he was dying, being martyred in Acts 7, 56. Now, Son of Man is a title of humanity. Right? Son of God means, means this person is the manifestation of God. But the Son of Man is a title of humanity. We've already, we've already learned hypostatic union, fully man, fully God. Other titles for Christ, such as Son of God, are overt in their focus on His deity. But Son of Man is a contrast. It focuses on the humanity of Christ. And God called the prophet Ezekiel, Son of Man, 93 times. In this way, God was simply calling Ezekiel a human being. We see this in Daniel as well. Son of man is simply a, 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 para, a, a paraphrastic term for human. Just another word that means human. Jesus Christ was truly a human being. He came in the flesh, 1 John chapter 4. So, Son of Man is a title of humanity. Son of Man is a title of humility. So the second person of the Trinity, eternal in nature, left the glory of heaven and took on human flesh, becoming, the word becoming flesh, becoming the Son of Man, born in a manger. Now when it says Son of Man, of course, it's not saying Son of a man, Son of Mankind. 
So we use, especially today, in the gender pronoun war that's going on, we, we've lost track of language altogether. But son of man, son of mankind. We're born in a manger and despised and rejected by mankind. Isaiah 53, 3. The son of man had no place to lay his head. Luke 9, 58. The son of man ate and drank with sinners. Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. The son of man suffered at the hands of men. Matthew 17. This intentional lowering of his status from king of heaven to son of man is the epitome of Christ's humility. Now, son of man is a title of humanity. It's a title of humility. And of course, also, it's a title of deity. Now, Ezekiel may have been a son of man, but Jesus is the son of man. As such, Jesus is the supreme example of all that God intended mankind to be. He's the embodiment of truth and grace, as we've read in John already. And in him, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, Colossians chapter 2. And because of this, the Son of Man was able to forgive sins. The only one. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, Mark chapter 2, verse 28. And the Son of Man came to save lives. Came to, he rose from the dead and executes judgment. At his trial before the high priest, Jesus said, I say to all of you, this is Matthew 26, 64, where, where Jesus says, I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now this statement immediately ended the trial as the court accused our Lord of blasphemy and condemned Him to death. Of course, also, the Son of Man is a term that fulfills prophecy. Jesus' own claim before the high priest to be the Son of Man was a reference to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where we read this. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Daniel saw glory, worship, and an everlasting kingdom given to the Messiah. Here called the Son of Man. And Jesus applied this prophecy to himself. So he also spoke of his coming kingdom on other occasions. Now the author of Hebrews, many believe it to be Paul, but the whoever the author of Hebrews is, used a reference to the Son of Man in the Psalms to teach that Jesus, the true Son of Man, will be the ruler of all things. It's Hebrews chapter 2. We'll see it right here. We'll share it with you. We'll look at these two. Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 9, which say this, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere... What is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We go and compare this to Psalm 8. Psalm 8, we look at uh, 4 through 6. 
We'll start with three. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So this is the reference that the author of Hebrews is using. It says, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and on and on. So you see when people, there's also a movement today of people saying, hey, we just need to throw that Old Testament out. We don't need that anymore. No. That was, the, that was scripture for Jesus and everyone else in that period. So the Son of Man is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And Son of Man, filling that prophecy, will be the King. So, as we've learned, Jesus is fully God, but also fully human. Fully God, John chapter 1, verse 1. Fully human, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Son of God and the Son of Man, as those, He is deserving of both titles. All right, another one of the questions that comes up quite often. And it's a good question. It's the right question, if you don't know the answer. So if Jesus was eternal... We've, laid, we've made the case. Jesus is God. So if Jesus was eternal, then how could he die? What's that all about? But before you want, can answer this question, it's good to try to understand the doctrine of the, hyperstat, of the hypostatic union. Once again, folks, just so you're, so you're aware there. We've laid it out for you. What is the hypostatic union? It means... Hypostasis, substance, foundation is just unity of Christ's humanity and, and divinity in one hypostasis or individual existence. The personal union of Jesus' two natures, human and divine. So we've understood that. So when we see Jesus, we're looking at the man, but within him is also the divine nature. However, we cannot see divinity. It doesn't have weight, shape, or color. It's immaterial. It is spirit. So we must perceive the divine nature through the human nature of Christ. Therefore, we would see Jesus the man literally walking, literally breathing and eating. This clearly displays his human nature. But we also see that he said that he would always be with us wherever we were. This shows his divine nature. So, when it comes to Jesus' death on the cross, we must understand that it was not the divine nature of Christ that died. Instead, it was His human nature. The divine nature is eternal and cannot die. That's Psalm 90. Let's look at that to get our scriptural reference for that. That's Psalm 90. Two, it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth. Sorry. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The divine nature is eternal and cannot die. We also see this in uh, Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, that's Yahweh, do not change. For I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. So divine nature cannot die. But human nature can die. And Jesus did so on the cross. So when we say that Jesus is eternal, we're speaking of the divine aspect, that divine nature he possesses. But when we say that Jesus died, we're speaking of the human aspect, the human nature that died on the cross. And once again, we think back earlier when we spoke of the 
instances in Scripture where Jesus is clearly God. He's worshipped as God. He's prayed to. He is sinless. He knows all things, gives eternal life. Uh, all the fullness of the deity dwells in him. And as a man, he worshipped the Father. He prayed to the Father. He was tempted. He grew in wisdom. He died. He had a body of flesh and bones. Once again, just like the where he answered the question, what, what's important? Why, why a virgin birth? That is to, to circumvent the sin nature that comes through being born of men, of, uh, of an earthly, of a human father. So that's why the virgin birth. And if Jesus was eternal, then how could he die? Well, it was the human nature. This is why he was a perfect sacrifice. So now, as we've laid all this out for you, let's look at for a second just some of the objection. A little bit of the objections that you're likely to hear somewhere out there. You're probably not going to hear very many sophisticated objections to Jesus' existence. Uh, his, his, his claims or scripture in general. You're not going to hear very many sophisticated ones. Uh, but rest assured in this, there is no objection to Christianity, no objection to the existence and the deity of Christ or scripture. There is not one that hasn't been seen, heard, responded to. There are no new objections to scripture. They've all been covered. So that, because of that, you can rest assured that it is something you can handle. So this is what Vody Balkum's written about some of the objections to the existence of Christ and where you might see it coming from today. One of those, of course, is the Jesus Seminar. that up there for you. While the news and social media give us insight into what popular culture is thinking, the Academy sheds light on those individuals who are shaping the thinking of others. So most of the ideas that have gained popularity today started out as theories in the Academy a generation or so ago. And due to the speed and ease with which information travels these days, that process has been condensed considerably. Hence, Instead of taking a generation uh, to affect the thinking of the masses, today's academy can do it in a matter of days or weeks. So it doesn't take it doesn't take months on end to publish a book with objections to Christianity or Jesus, life and existence even. Today you can do it in a matter of minutes even. Three examples stand out in this regard. They are the new atheists, the Jesus Seminar, and this thing called the New Perspective on Paul. Now, the new atheists may have declined recently in popularity. However, they have not gone away. They have spawned a whole generation of new and what I call pop atheism. Their new breed of skepticism touched a nerve in a broad cross-section of society. Unlike their predecessors, the new atheists are not limited to success in the academic arena. Christopher Hitchens is a household name, for example. Uh, moreover, their virulent anti-Christian rhetoric has been given a pass in the press. You see, it's okay. It's okay to mock Christianity. I wonder why that is. Now, as a preacher... One cannot address, for example, passages involving warfare and the slaying of the wicked without this new elephant in the room, which is, what about those people who say this is why religion is evil? Well, that brings us to the Jesus Seminar, which is a less popular than the New Atheist Movement. However, they do represent the baseline of contemporary opposition to the gospel. People may not know Marcus Borg, John Dominic Crossan, Bishop Spong as well, I'll throw in there. But they are probably aware of the, of the search for the historical Jesus, and the book, and, and all it entails. For a while back in the 1980s and 90s, the Jesus Seminar was regular fare on the History Channel and in magazines like Time and Newsweek. 
their skepticism was front page news. And you see it still every Christmas and Easter. These, you'll see their, their writings showing up on Time Magazine, Newsweek. You'll see these things pop up. So whenever you do, you, the, we've seen this recently where there's some uh, out on the newsstands. Who was Jesus? What about these apostles? Typically, these are coming from this thing known as the Jesus Seminar. Now, the, the, the people to whom we preach are more aware of the work of this group than they might even admit. You might not even know that a lot of what you have come to believe is true about Jesus might have come from groups like this who were actually out there working to discredit, discount a historical and a scriptural Jesus. You see, what's interesting about Jesus Christ and Christianity, there are many myths out there and myths that, myths that serve a good purpose. But what you get with Jesus Christ, that's where you get myth, narrative, and history. Meeting, coming together. Sure, there's myth there. It's, it has the power of myth. But then you find out, wait a minute, he's real. You don't get that. Any other religion, any other person, nowhere. That's completely unique to Christianity. That is the piece right there that seems to be bringing Jordan Peterson around to possibly, even though it might be some, let's just... Well, let's not worry about what denomination, but let, he's seems to be, if not already, has closer to accepting who who Jesus Christ is. Anyway, it's that because he's so big on myth. He's his his Jungian training. He understands myth, but the problem is that there's history. And Jesus is real. So when myth, when narrative and reality combined, you've got something extremely unique. So whenever you read a passage of Scripture touching on the virgin birth, the death, resurrection, or even the teaching of Jesus' questions, when those questions arise, people say, did that really happen? Or did Jesus really say that? Or was it added by the later Christian community? Can you trust the Bible? It's been changed so many times. Has it? Did the late, did the Christian community in the third and fourth century, did they try to make Jesus into God? Is that how it happened? But now, as expository apologists, we must always be ready to give an answer to the one who questions the very assumption that we can trust the Bible from which we preach. The new perspective on Paul, there's another one, the, this, the new atheist, the Jesus Seminar, and this other movement today known as the new perspective on Paul, on the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's more recent phenomenon, with, uh, and it reaches, its implications are greater. Now, whereas the new atheists are obviously outsiders to the faith, and the Jesus Seminar represents obvious apostasy, this new perspective on Paul movement, it's more mainstream. This movement comes from a camp that upholds and affirms the historicity of the Bible, and its main exponent, its main, the, the person probably most responsible for the, the, the new perspective on Paul, who, which is N.T. Wright, uh, is an intelligent, articulate, and winsome theologian with a British accent to boot, as Vody says here. But at its core, the new perspective on Paul movement is about the doctrine of justification and whether the tradition, Pauline, reading, understanding, is valid. So questioning the authority of what Paul, the Apostle Paul, contributed to Holy Scripture. You're on sacred ground. Be very careful. So, now, what's important about all this is that when we're contemplating major issues here about we're all apologists. You're one, too. Anytime someone comes up and asks you, why do you believe that? 
or, or when you seek to evangelize someone, you're going to be an apologist. That means you're going to be asked, you're going to be asked to answer questions. People are going to ask you things. They're going to want to know, why do you believe it? Why is it true? Can you prove to me it's true? So when contemplating these issues, we have to remember Solomon's words from Ecclesiastes. Chapter 1, where he says, What has been is what will be, and what has been is, or what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. And so this is absolutely the case with apologetics. However, recent history provides a number of new twists on old objections. There are no new objections to Christianity, but there are new twists. So the Jesus Seminar, this is one you'll see around. You'll, you might not know who they are, but you've heard their arguments, no doubt. It represents the radical left fringe of biblical criticism. It's, uh, mostly it's doctoral graduates of schools who tend to practice a more radical form of higher criticism. These schools include Harvard, Claremont, Vanderbilt, Chicago, Union Theological Seminary. Union Theological Seminary, very, very prominent in putting out apostasy these days. Uh, Luke Johnson states that it does not, quote, represent anything like a consensus view of scholars working in the New Testament, but only the views of a group that has been, for all its protestations of diversity, self-elected on the basis of prior agreement concerning the appropriate goals and methods for studying the Gospels and the figure of Jesus. In other words, what he's saying there is to be a member of the Jesus Seminar, you have to be one who doesn't believe Jesus was a real person or certainly doesn't believe that he was God. All right, so... We're coming around the mountain now. Let me remind you once again that at the, uh, at the end of the show today, we're going to be asking a question. And it's going to have to do with what we're learning today. So just in just a little bit here, not too much longer, I'm going to be asking you a question, and we're going to, and at that time, when, when we ask the question, you can answer it, and you can send your email into Summer. I'll give the, I'll give the email address here again in just a moment. And the first one to correctly answer the question, which is based on our presentation today, it's going to be one of the terms we've used here today. The first person to answer that question uh, correctly for us is going to win one of our Putting on the Armor, Equipped and Deployed for Spiritual Warfare books. This is the study we did, uh, we finished up a couple months ago by Chuck Lawless. Are you ready for battle? It is an eight-section study. You can do your own Bible study with this. You can get together with your group, your family, whatever. It's excellent for that. All right, so pay attention. At the end here, just a little bit, probably just about another 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes, we'll be getting to the end, and we'll be coming to the end of part one, and we'll ask the question for the giveaway. Now, the way we want to bring this back around today is, if you remember, we started out in the uh, Gospel of John. One of the questions you're going to get when you're a follower of Jesus Christ in this world today is, well, aren't all, all the religions the same? Two, two other important questions, like, why is Jesus any different than Buddha or Muhammad or whoever or the Maitreya, whatever? Why is Jesus different? His very name bothers people. The name Jesus inspires people. The name Jesus embarrasses people. Sometimes it makes people angry. Sometimes it makes people just want to change the subject. You bring up Jesus, they want to get away from you as fast as possible. You can talk about God and 
people don't necessarily get upset, do they? If you just talk about God. And people don't necessarily uh, get upset about that. But when you mention Jesus, then people want to stop the conversation. So once again, why don't the names Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, why don't those names offend people the way the name of Jesus does? Maybe the reason is that these other religious leaders never claimed to be God. That's the big difference between Jesus and the others. That's why Jesus is different. He was obviously making claims to deity. He was presenting himself as the only avenue to salvation and the only source of forgiveness of sins. Things they knew that only God could claim. For many people today, Jesus' claim to be the Son of God is too exclusive. It's not tolerant enough. And that's what you see in our pluralistic culture. It's too narrow. To say that Jesus is the only way, it's too narrow. And it's religious bigotry. People don't want to believe it. Yet, the issue is not what we want to believe, but rather, who did Jesus say he was? Who did he claim to be? And is his claim true? Jesus said he was the Son of God. Why is that a problem for many people? Why is it less offensive to talk about God than it is to talk about Jesus? I think because when we talk about, you bring up the name God, you can make up your own God. People can make up, and people do. Most people have idol, have, have an idol, have a God they've created. Most people don't know who God is. They don't understand the holiness of God. That's certainly God is love, but he's also wrath. He has to be, or he's not just. The words of Jesus Christ are not a first and last name, of course, which we've learned. They're actually a name and a title. The name Jesus is derived from the Greek form of the name Yeshua, or Joshua. And it means Jehovah Savior, or the Lord saves. The title Christ, or anointed one, or Messiah, is derived from the Greek word for Messiah, or the Hebrew uh, Meshiach. You see that in Daniel 9.26. And it means anointed one. Jesus fulfilled two offices, king and priest. And these are indicated in the use of the title Christ. The title affirms Jesus as the promised priest and king of Old Testament prophecies. This affirmation is crucial to a proper understanding about Jesus and Christianity. Once again, the name Jesus means Jehovah Savior or the Lord saves. And Christ is a title, not his last name. It's a title derived from the Greek word for Messiah and means anointed one. So why is Jesus different? None of these other figures, characters, claim to be God. And they certainly didn't set out to prove it. Now, so that brings up the, the question too. Okay, let's just, so people come around and they believe, okay, I believe you. Jesus lived. I, I, I believe, I understand. The history shows that there was a man called Jesus. But there are other options, right? You say he's the Lord, but he could be just a liar, just a really good liar. Or he could be crazy, could be a crazy man. This is the old argument, Lord, liar, or lunatic. Which is it? So if you Google the name Jesus today, you'll instantly come up with about 180 million hits. Search for Jesus on Amazon and you'll find well over a quarter million books about him. So given all of these competing views, can you still have confidence in a historical Jesus? Many people want to regard Jesus not as God, but as a good and moral man, you know, a good teacher, maybe a prophet. Somebody who spoke many profound truths, but not God. Scholars often pass off that uh, 
that conclusion as the only acceptable one that people can, can reach by their intellectual process. And many people simply nod their heads in agreement and never trouble themselves to see the fallacy of such reasoning. Jesus claimed to be God, and to him it was of fundamental importance that men and women believed him to be who he said he was. Now, either we believe him or we don't. We don't get to make up some other title and purpose for him. You either believe he is what he said he was or you don't. He didn't leave us any, any other options. One who claimed that Jesus, one who claimed what Jesus claimed about himself, couldn't be a, a good moral man or a prophet. Now, that option is not open to us. And Jesus never intended it to be. Now, we get this from C.S. Lewis, former professor at Cambridge University, one of the one of the great early, uh, well, not early, but one of the great apologists from the from uh, recent decades. He was once an agnostic, but he came into the faith, and he understood this issue clearly. He wrote it. He wrote about it this way. He says, "I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus." Which is this, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis writes and says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or he's a madman, or something worse. Lewis goes on to say, you can, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being some great human teacher. He didn't leave us that option, and he didn't intend to. So his claim must either be true or false, and everyone should give it the same kind of consideration. He expected of his disciples when he put the question to them, when he said in Matthew 16, 15, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And there are several alternatives. First, consider that his claim to be God was false. If it were false, then we have only two alternatives. He either knew it was false or he didn't know it was false. We'll consider each possibility separately and examine the evidence for it. Now, was Jesus a liar? Which is one of the claims you'll hear that he just made it up. Either some people just made up a character called Jesus, or this person called Jesus was just the greatest liar ever. If when Jesus made his claims, he knew that he was not God, and then he was lying and deliberately deceiving his followers. But if he was a liar, then he was also a hypocrite because he taught others to be honest, whatever the cost, you see. Worse than that, if he was lying, he was a demon because he told others to trust him for their eternal destiny. If he couldn't back up his claims, and he knew it, then he was unspeakably evil for deceiving his followers with such a false hope. Last, he would also be a fool because his claims to being God led to his own crucifixion. Claims he could have backed away from to save himself at the last minute or at any time along the process. It's amazing to hear so many people say that Jesus was just, oh, he's probably just some kind of good teacher. Most people in the street will say that if you ask them. But let's be realistic. How could he be a great moral teacher and knowingly mislead people at the most important point of his teaching, which is his identity? To conclude that Jesus was a deliberate liar doesn't coincide with what we know either of him or of the results of his life and teachings. Whether Jesus has been proclaimed, wherever he's been proclaimed, we see lives changing for the good. 
wherever he has been proclaimed, we see nations changing for the better. Thieves becoming honest, alcoholics becoming sober, hateful individuals becoming channels of love, unjust persons coming to embrace justice. William Lecky, one of Great Britain's most noted historians and a fierce opponent of organized Christianity, saw the effect of true Christianity on the world, and he wrote it this way. Quote, it was reserved for Christianity to present to the world an ideal which through all the changes of 18 centuries has inspired the hearts of men with an impassioned love, has shown itself capable of acting on all ages, nations, temperaments, and conditions, has been not only the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive to its practice. The simple record of these three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. So here, a strong opponent of Christianity explained it very clearly. What effect Christianity has had on the world. Now, historian uh, Philip Schaff says it this way. He says, this testimony... Jesus, that Jesus is God. If it's not true, must be downright blasphemy or madness. Self-deception in a matter so momentous and with an intellect in, in all respects so clear and so sound is equally out of the question. It's not possible that he was a blasphemer or a liar. How could he be an enthusiast or a madman who never lost the even balance of his mind? who sailed serenely over all the troubles and persecutions as the sun above the clouds, who always returned the wisest answer to tempting questions, who calmly and deliberately predicted his death on the cross, his resurrection on the third day, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the founding of his own church, the destruction of Jerusalem, predictions which have been literally fulfilled a character so original, so complete, so uniformly consistent, so perfect, so human, and set so high above all human greatness, can be neither a fraud nor a fiction. The poet, as has been well said, would in this case be greater than the hero. It would take more than a Jesus to invent a Jesus. And he goes on to give a good argument against Christ being a liar when he says, How in the name of logic, common sense, and experience could an imposter, that is deceitful, selfish, depraved man, have invented and consistently maintained from the beginning to the end the purest and noblest character known in history with the most perfect air of truth and reality? How could he have conceived and carried out a plan of unparalleled uh, benefic uh, beneficence, moral magnitude, and sublimity? and sacrificed his own life for it in the face of the strongest prejudices of his people and age. So if Jesus wanted to get people to follow him and believe him as God, why did, he go to the, uh, why did he go to the Jewish nation? Why go as a common carpenter in an undistinguished village in a country so small in size and population? Why go to a country so thoroughly adhered to the concept of one God? Why didn't he go to Egypt or even to Greece where they already believed in various gods and various manifestations of them? He went to the hardest place. Someone who lived as Jesus lived, taught as he taught, and died as Jesus died could not have been a liar. So, could he be a crazy man? That's liar, lunatic. And if those don't work, then he's Lord. So is he crazy? Was Jesus a crazy man? Was he a lunatic? If we find it inconceivable that Jesus was a liar, then couldn't he actually have mistakenly thought himself to be God? He was delusional, perhaps, right? After all, it's possible to be both sincere and wrong at the same time. But we must remember that for someone to mistakenly think himself God, especially in the context of a fiercely monotheistic culture like the Jews, and then to tell others that their eternal destiny depended on believing in him, that's no small flight of fancy, but uh, delusions and ravings of an outright lunatic. Is it possible that Jesus Christ was deranged? 
So today we would treat someone who believes himself to be God in the same way we would treat someone who believes him, he is Napoleon. We would see him as deluded and self-deceived. We would lock him up so he wouldn't hurt himself or anyone else. Yet in Jesus, we don't observe the abnormalities and imbalance that go along with such derangement. If he was insane, his poise and composure was nothing short of amazing. Eminent uh, psychiatric pioneers, Arthur Noyes and uh, Lawrence Kolb, in their, in their book, Modern Clinical Psychiatry, their textbook, describes the schizophrenic as a person who is more autistic than realistic. The schizophrenic desires to escape from the world of reality. So let's face it, for a mere man to claim to be God would certainly be a retreat from reality. But in light of other things we know about Jesus, it's hard to imagine that he was mentally disturbed. Here is a man who spoke some of the most profound words ever recorded. His instructions have liberated many people in the mental bondage. Clark H. Pinnock, professor emeritus of systematic theology at McMaster Divinity College, asks, Was he deluded about his greatness? A paranoid? An unintentional deceiver? A schizophrenic, perhaps? Again, the skill and depth of his teaching support the case only for his total mental soundness and clarity. If only we were as sane as he. A student at California University once said that his psychology professor had said in a class that all he has to do is pick up the Bible and read portions of Christ's teaching to many of his patients. And that's all the counseling they need. And this is what psychologist Gary Collins says about Jesus. He says he was... Loving but didn't let his compassion immobilize him. He didn't have a bloated ego. Even though he was often surrounded by adoring crowds, he maintained balance despite an often demanding lifestyle. He always knew what he was doing and where he was going. He cared deeply about people, including women and children, who weren't seen as important in that day. He was able to accept people while not merely winking at their sin. He responded to individuals based on where they were and what they uniquely needed. All in all, I just don't see signs that Jesus was suffering from any known mental illness. He was much healthier than anyone else I know, including myself. So that gives us a little bit of a little insight in there. So, not a liar, not a lunatic. Was Jesus Lord? That's the only choice we have left. So if we can't conclude that he was a liar or a lunatic, the only other alternative is that he was who he said he was. Is that he was and is the Christ, the Son of God, as he claimed. But in spite of the logic and evidence, many people cannot seem to bring themselves to this conclusion. People go with what feels right today more than what they can show to be true. In the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown claims, or he says, Quote, by officially endorsing Jesus as the Son of God, Constantine turned Jesus into a deity who existed beyond the scope of the human world, an entity whose power was unchallengeable. Novelist uh, Brown, Dan Brown, wants people to believe the idea that Christ's deity was invented at the Council of Nicaea. Although discussed prominently in popular culture, that so-called fact has been rejected by well over 99.9% .9 of biblical scholars who study documented history. And here's why. The New Testament itself provides the earliest evidence for the belief that Jesus is divine. Since these documents were composed in the first century, just decades after events surrounding Jesus, they predate the Council of Nicaea by more than two centuries. That's 200 years. While they were written by different people for a variety of purposes, one unmistakable theme they share is that Christ is God. The anti-Nicene fathers, the ones who came before that council, provide additional support that Jesus 
was considered divine long before the Council of Nicaea. They were early Christian thinkers who lived after the close of the New Testament period, about the year 100, yet before the Council of Nicaea, which happened in the 4th century, in 325. Those Antinicene fathers, the ones who came before the Council of Nicaea, included men such as Justin Martyr, Ignatius, and Irenaeus. There's no doubt that they understood Jesus to be divine. Consider some quotes from their ancient works. So those who came before the Council at Nicaea, for those who believe that Jesus was the creation of the, his deity was created at the Council of Nicaea, or that even the doctrine of the Trinity was created at the Council of Nicaea. Ignatius of Antioch in the year 110 said, God incarnate, God himself appearing in the form of man. Justin Martyr said, being the first begotten word of God is even God. Irenaeus said, The Father is God, and the Son is God. For he who is born of God is God. Melito of Sardis said, He was man, yet he is God. The Probably the most convincing evidence that Jesus was considered divine before the council comes from non-Christian writers. The Greek satirist Lucian of Samosata, the Roman philosopher Celsus, and the Roman governor, Pliny the Younger, make it clear that early Christians understood Jesus as divine. Pliny persecuted Christians because of their belief that Jesus was divine. So clearly, that was the claim. Pliny acknowledged, he said, quote, They had met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately among themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God. Unquote. Given these facts, in addition to many more, the authors of Reinventing Jesus conclude to suggest that Constantine had the ability or even the inclination to manipulate the council into believing what it did not already embrace, including the doctrine of the Trinity, is at best a silly notion. The evidence is clear. Jesus was believed to be divine long before the Council of Nicaea. So the issue with these three alternatives, liar, lunatic, or Lord, is not which is possible, because obviously all three are possible. Rather, the question is, which is most probable? You cannot put him on the shelf merely as a great moral teacher or a prophet. That's not a valid option. He is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord and God. You have to make your choice doesn't matter what choice you make, he's still Lord and God. But your decision about Jesus must be more than an idle intellectual exercise. As the Apostle John wrote, These are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and more importantly, that by, being, that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. Once again, that's Gospel of John chapter 20. So the evidence is most clearly and obviously in favor that Jesus is Lord. Now, to bring this one uh, down the home stretch, once again, we're doing a, a series here on who is Jesus. We want to know. We want to be able to answer the question when people ask. And so now, please keep, also keep in mind, at the end, after we finish this section, now we're going to look at some key events in Jesus' life. We want to know who He is. We want to have a high Christology. What is a Christology? The study of the person and work of Christ. All of us have a Christology. The only question is, do you have a low Christology or a high Christology? Do you, uh, a low Christology would be someone who, kind of like the Jesus Seminar, who thinks that this probably didn't exist, we don't know too much, certainly wasn't God. That's a very low Christology. What we want is a very high Christology, that He was who He said He was. He showed it that He's our Lord. He's our King. He's our Master. Yes, you're so courteous. 
So at the end, once again, we're going to ask, we're going to ask you a question about the presentation today. It has to do with one of the specific terms that we use today. I'll give you the email address in just a minute, and you can answer. I'll, I'll give you the question after we finish this section. What were the key events in the life of Jesus Christ? Well, we have his birth, his baptism, his first miracle, the Sermon on the Mount, feeding the 5,000, probably many more than that, the transfiguration, the raising of Lazarus, his triumphal entry, Last Supper, the arrest at Gethsemane, his crucifixion and burial, of course, his resurrection, and then, of course, his post-resurrection appearances, and then his ascension. So with, in uh, Matthew chapters 1 and 2, and Luke chapter 2, and these passages are all the elements of the well-known Christmas story, the beginning of the, early, of the earthly life of Christ. Mary and Joseph, no room at the inn, the babe in the manger, the shepherds with their flocks, a multitude of angels rejoicing. We also see wise men from the east following the star to Bethlehem and bearing gifts for the Christ child and Joseph, Mary and Jesus, escaping to Egypt later, returning to Nazareth. Escaped to Egypt when they heard Herod wanted to kill all the, all the, all those less than two years of age because he had heard that there was a contender. These passages also include Jesus being presented at the temple at eight days old, and at twelve years old, remaining behind at the temple, speaking with the teachers there. The story of the birth of the Savior two thousand years ago is amazing, filled with exquisite and meaningful details treasured by those present as well as, believe, as believers 2,000 years later. But the story of God coming to earth as a man began thousands of years earlier with the prophecies of the coming Messiah. God spoke of His Savior in Genesis 3, 15. Centuries later, Isaiah foretold of a virgin, not just a young woman, but a virgin who would conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's Isaiah 7, 14. The first of the key events in the life of Christ is the humble beginning in a stable. When God came to be with us, born to set his people free and to save us from our sins, he did so in the most humble of ways. And then next we, we see uh, the, the next important point, event in the life of Christ was His uh, baptism. Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3. Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist at the Jordan River is the first act of His public ministry. This is where Jesus, uh, Jesus' work began at His baptism. This baptism from John was a baptism of repentance. Although Jesus did not need such a baptism, He consented to it in order to identify Himself with sinners. He was taking on the sin of the world. In fact, when John balked that Jesus wanted to be baptized by him, saying that it was he, John, who should be baptized by Jesus, Jesus insisted. He said, it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So John did as requested. So in his baptism, Jesus identified with the sinners whose sins he would soon bear on the cross, where he would exchange his righteousness for their sin. So this baptism symbolized his death and resurrection, prefigured and lent importance to Christian baptism, and publicly identified Christ with those for whom he would die. His identity as the long-awaited Messiah was confirmed by God himself who spoke from heaven when he said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 And... Also, Jesus' baptism was the scene of the very first appearance of the Trinity to man. 
is the first appearance of the Trinity to man. The Son was baptized, the Father spoke from heaven, and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. The Father's command, the Son's obedience, and the Holy Spirit's empowerment present an amazing picture of the ministry and life of our Savior. And so the next key event in the life of Christ was his first miracle. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So it's fitting that John's gospel is the only one that records Jesus' first miracle. And once again, we'll be, we'll be moving through. Now, there isn't enough time in the world to do a proper verse-by-verse, line-by-line exposition of the gospel of John, but we'll take, its, we'll take, the, we'll take the main themes as we learn throughout this series, who is Jesus? John's account of the life of Christ has its theme and purpose to reveal the deity of Christ, and does so right from the prologue. This event, where Jesus turns water into wine, his first miracle at the wedding, shows his divine power over the elements of the earth, the same power that would be revealed again in many more miracles of healing, and being able to control the elements such as wind and the sea. John goes on to tell us that the first miracle had two outcomes. This is where he changes the water to wine at the wedding. The glory of Christ was manifest and the disciples believed in him. The divine glorified nature of Christ was hidden when he assumed human form. But in instances such as this first miracle... His true nature burst forth and was made manifest to all who had eyes to see. The disciples always believe in Jesus, but the miracles help to strengthen their faith and prepare them for the difficult times that lay ahead of them. And there's an application for our lives. Things are not going to be getting easier. They're going to be getting harder. How do you get through it? Faith, trusting in who Jesus said he was, and what he's done for us. And so next, key event in the life of Jesus Christ, of course, is Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably the most famous sermon of all time. And of course, was preached by the head of the church himself, Jesus, to his disciples. And this was early on in his ministry. And from it come many memorable phrases that we know today including blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, the, the, the phrase salt of the earth, an eye for an eye, the lilies of the field, ask and you will receive uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. Also concepts like going the extra mile, turning the other cheek, and the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing when you give your alms, for example. Also in the sermon, you, you get the Lord's Prayer. But what's most important here, the Sermon on the Mount dealt a devastating blow to the Pharisees and their religion of works righteousness. By by emphasizing the spirit of the law and not just the letter of it, Jesus left no doubt that legalism is of no avail for salvation and that, in fact, the demands of the law are humanly impossible to meet. He ends the sermon with a call to true faith for salvation and a warning that the way to that salvation is narrow and few will find it. Jesus compares those who hear his words and put them into practice to wise builders who build their houses on a solid foundation so that when storms come, Your house will withstand it. The next key event in the life of Jesus was the feeding of the 5,000. It was probably more, probably more. Let's let's see what it says here. The five from, from, this is from Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, Gospel of John chapter 6. So from five small loaves and two fish, Jesus created enough food, once again, showing his control over the elements of the earth, created enough food to feed at least 5,000 people, 
The gospel tells us, the gospels tell us that there were 5,000 men present, but Matthew adds that there were women and children there also. Estimates of the crowd are as high as 20,000. But of course, our Lord, our God, is a God of abundant provision. And little is much in the hands of a Lord. It's an important lesson, and it's learned by seeing that before he multiplied the loaves and fishes, Jesus commanded the multitude to sit down. This is a, an interesting picture of the power of God to accomplish what we cannot while we rest in him. I said to sit down while I feed you. Rest while I feed you. There was nothing the people could do to feed themselves. Only he could do that. They had followed him out into the middle of nowhere through faith, and he fed them. They had only a pittance. They had very little to offer, but in God's hands it became a feast. That was not only sufficient, it was a bounty. Now, that's an application for you right here today. You might think you have very little. You don't have much to offer. Think of that. Yeah, what God can do with a little. So the next uh, key event in Jesus' life is this transfiguration that we see in Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9. Now, the transfiguration, meaning a change in form. Because Jesus was changed before the eyes of Peter, James, and John into a reflection of his true nature, his divine glory radiated from him, changing his face and clothing in such a way that the gospel writers had trouble relating it. Just as the apostle John used many metaphors to describe what he saw in the visions of Revelation, so too did Matthew, Mark, and Luke have to resort to images like lightning and the sun and light to describe Jesus' appearance. They didn't have the words. So it must have been otherworldly. The appearance of, also, the appearance of Moses and Elijah to converse with Jesus, it shows us two things. First, it shows us that the two men represent the law and the prophets, both of which foretold Jesus' coming and his death. And secondly, the fact that they talked about his upcoming death in Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9, verse 31 this shows their foreknowledge of the events and the sovereign plan of God that was unfolding just as God had said it would, just as Jesus said it would. God spoke from heaven and commanded the disciples to hear him, thereby stating that Jesus, not Moses and Elijah, now had the power and authority to command them. And then after that, one of the, one of the stories that we're going to be focused on here. In this study series is John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus, who was the brother of Mary and Martha of Bethany. Probably interesting about the story about this is that it seems like when Jesus, who was a man, also a man, from time to time, needed to get away. He had a hard job, if you remember here. He had a tough deal. He was, wherever he went, people constantly... Following, he, and he was being chased and, and threatened. They wanted to kill him. It's a tough life, tough lifestyle. So when he went to get away, Bethany was the place he went, it seems, to go relax with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. These are, the, these are those who were his best friends, I guess is a way to explain it. The people he felt most comfortable with, closest to and most comfortable with. They were all personal friends of Jesus, which is why Jesus was sent for by them, by their family, when Lazarus was sick. Jesus delayed several days before going to Bethany, knowing that Lazarus would be dead long enough by then to verify this amazing display of divine power. Now, what is the deal? Why did he wait so many days? It's like on the fourth day he showed up to do this. Well, there was a Jewish belief at that time that in the first three days after death, the, the soul kind of came back and revisited the body. It just sort of, it's, it's a strange idea that the soul would kind of linger around the body for three days. 
So if you ever wonder, why did he wait until that day? Why did he wait until the third or fourth day to show up? It's because of this. It's just, just so that those who did hold that belief wouldn't be able to use that as the reason Lazarus rose. He waited until, until all doubt, all reasonable doubt could be gone. In other words, Lazarus would be dead long enough by then that this, this miracle could be verified. This display of divine power could be verified. Only God has the power over life and death. And by raising Lazarus from the grave, Jesus was reiterating, showing once again his authority as God and his supremacy over death. Through this incident, the Son of God would be glorified in an unmistakable way. As with many other miracles and incidents, one of the goals was that the disciples, and, and for us too, so that we may believe. John chapter 20, verse 31, I told you these things so that you, so that you would believe. Jesus is who he said he was. And this most astounding of his miracles testifies to this fact. Jesus told Martha in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life and asked her if she believed what he was saying. This is the basis of the Christian life. We believe that Jesus is the very power of resurrection. and We trust in him to give us eternal life through that power. We're buried with him and raised by his authority over death. But it's only through his power that we can truly be saved. So you can see here these important points, these key, key events in the life of Christ are not there just to say, wow, what a cool story. There's meaning there. There's intricate meaning in all of them. And the next key event in the life of Jesus was his triumphal entry that we see in Matthew 21, 14, Mark 11, Luke 19, John 12. It's his triumphal entry into Jerusalem in the week before his crucifixion. This is what's known as uh, Palm Sunday. The multitudes who greeted him laid palm branches in the road for him. But their worship of him was short-lived. In just a few days, these same crowds would be calling for his death, shouting, crucify him, crucify him, in Luke 23. But as he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt, signifying his lowliness and humble state, he received the adoration of the crowd and their acknowledgement of his messianic claim. Even the little children welcomed him, demonstrating that they knew what the Jewish leaders didn't know, that Jesus was God. He was the Messiah. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah repeated in John 12, 15, which says, See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Fulfilling the prophecies. The next big event, which we'll see also in this Gospel of John, is the Last Supper. We see it in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and of course John chapter 13. This is, this is Jesus' last meeting with his disciples, who he loved. And this meeting begins with an object lesson from Jesus. The disciples had been arguing about who among them was the greatest. In fact, uh, that's what Leonardo uh, da Vinci's uh, Last Supper is, is. The moment that he tried to capture there was at the moment. I think actually that one is about uh, when, when he says that one of you will betray me. And then on their faces, they're all, is it, is it me? Is it I? And I think that's, if I understand it correctly, reading about Da Vinci's Last Supper, that's the moment he chose to capture. That moment of doubt, that moment of, of not, not necessarily doubt, but that moment of concern. So the disciples had been arguing about who among them was the greatest, Luke 22, and displaying their distinctly ungodly perspective. Jesus quietly rose and began to wash their feet a task normally performed by the lowest, most menial slave. And by this simple act, he reminded them that his followers are those who serve one another. 
not those who expect to be served. He went on to explain that unless the Lamb of God cleanses a person's sin, that person will never be clean. John 13, 8 says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So during the Last Supper, Jesus also identifies the traitor Judas, who would betray him to the authorities and bring about his arrest. The disciples were saddened when Jesus said that one of them would betray him and wondered which one it could be. And that's where they say that the Last Supper, that's the moment it was trying to, uh, trying to capture. After Judas' departure, Jesus instituted the new covenant in his blood and gave a new command that those who follow him, I give you a new commandment, love one another. And live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we remember Jesus giving of the new covenant each time we enter into the Christian ordinance of communion. We break the bread and we have the, we have the wine celebrating Christ's body that was broken for us and His blood that was shed for us. That's the mindset that should be on the, in, in the communion, thinking of what He has done for us and thinking of that moment when He brought us the new covenant. The law is fulfilled. The moment we no longer, no longer under the law, now under grace. And of course, after that, the next key event in the life of Jesus is His arrest at Gethsemane. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, John 18. After the Last Supper, Jesus led the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, where several things took place. First of all, Jesus went away to pray. And He asked the disciples, his disciples to, to watch and pray as well. But, of course, several times He returned to find them sleeping. Overcome with fatigue and grief at the prospect of losing Him, as Jesus prayed, He asked the Father to remove the cup of wrath He was about to drink. When God poured out on him the punishment for the sins of the world. But as in all things, Jesus submitted to the will of his Father and began to prepare for his death, strengthened by an angel sent to minister to him in his last hours. And then Judas arrives with a multitude and identified Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus was arrested and taken to Caiaphas for the first of a series of what were really mock trials. Brings us to the next key moment in, in Jesus' life, which was the crucifixion and burial. The death of Jesus on the cross was the culmination of his ministry on earth. It's the reason he was born as a man, it was to die for the sins of the world, so that those who believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. After being found innocent of all charges against him, Jesus was nevertheless handed over to the Romans to be crucified. And so the events of that day are recorded as including his seven last sayings. The mocking and taunting by the soldiers in the crowd, the casting of lots among the soldiers for his clothing, and three hours of darkness, all of which fulfilled prophecy. At the moment Jesus gave up his spirit, there was an earthquake. And the huge heavy curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn from top to bottom, signifying that access to God was now open to all who believe in Jesus Christ. He became everyone's high priest in that moment. The body of Jesus was taken down from the cross, laid in a borrowed tomb to fulfill prophecy, and left until after the Sabbath. Then, of course... The moment that makes us all Christians, the next key event in his life is the resurrection. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. Now the Bible doesn't record the actual resurrection so much as it tells of the empty tomb and the news that Jesus had risen. It also speaks of him appearing to many. We find out that Jesus has risen from the dead when women come to the tomb where he had been laid, 
They came there to prepare his body. The Gospels each offer different details regarding the account. Not different accounts, just different details of the same account. Many times you might hear people say to you, Yeah, well, was it two women or one woman at the tomb? Was there two angels or one angel at the tomb? You see, you can't trust it because the details are wrong. Well, this kind of goes back to something that uh, uh, a little uh, a little thing that Michael Lacona, who wrote a book on the resurrection, said one time. It was like this: those people, when the Titanic sank, there were some people that reported that the Titanic went down in one piece. Some people reported that the Titanic broke in half and went down in two pieces. But what nobody reported was that the Titanic didn't sink. Everyone knew that. So you see, just because the details might be different, it doesn't mean the outcome wasn't the same. The tomb was empty. The women were bewildered. The angels announced to them that Jesus had risen and Jesus appeared to them. Peter and John also verified that the tomb was empty. And Jesus appeared to the disciples as well. But the first person, the first set of human eyes to see the, the risen Jesus Christ was a prostitute his, and, and, uh, and his trusted confidant. Women are, are in extremely important positions in the gospel. Who is it that's left standing at the foot of the cross? Well, all the guys ran away because they didn't want, they were afraid of the Jews, afraid of even the Romans. They were afraid of being arrested themselves. Who was it that stayed at the foot of the cross through the whole thing? Jesus' mother, Jesus' aunt, and once again, Mary Magdalene, along with uh, John, who's beloved apostle. He was there as well, but... Isn't that interesting? Now, next, we've got two more key events that we, that we, for Jesus. And this, after the resurrection, of course, we have his appearances, those who saw him. We know the first one, Mary Magdalene. But post-resurrection appearances, which we see in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John chapter 20, Acts chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 15, during the 40 days between the crucifixion and, and his ascension, Jesus appeared several times to 500 of his disciples and others. He first appeared to the women near the tomb who came to prepare his body for burial, then to Mary Magdalene, whom, to whom he declared that he had not yet ascended to the Father. Jesus appeared again to two men on the road to Emmaus, and as he ate with these two, and talked with them, they recognized him. The men returned to Jerusalem, found the disciples, and testified of their encounter with Jesus. And then, at the upper room, he walked through a wall and appeared to the disciples in Jerusalem, where Thomas was. And ultimately, Thomas was given that proof that he asked for. And again in Galilee, where they saw another miracle. Though they had fished all night and caught nothing, Jesus told them to lower their nets one more time. They weren't sure who he was. According to, when you read this account, they're not sure who it is until he tells them to lower their net one more time and they pull their nets back up, filled with fish. They're almost breaking. And then Jesus, once they recognize who he was, Jesus cooked breakfast for them and taught them many important truths. And Peter was told, Jesus said to him plainly, feed my sheep. And then Jesus told Peter the manner of death that he would suffer. And at this time, they also received the Great Commission. Take the gospel. All the world. Make disciples of all the nations. <clears throat> and then the last of the key events in the life of Jesus was his ascension. Mark chapter 16, Luke 24, Acts chapter 1. This is Jesus' final act on earth. 
It was his ascension into heaven in the presence of the disciples. He was taken up in a cloud that hid him from their view. But two angels came to tell them that he would return one day in a similar manner. For now, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven in his human body, hypostatic union, fully God and fully man, still in the same form. That's what Scripture tells us. It's not making it up. The act of sitting down, sitting down at the right hand of power, the act of sitting down signifies that his work is done. As he affirmed before dying on the cross when he said, Tetelestai, he said, it is finished. There's nothing more to be done to secure the salvation of those who believe in him. At this point, at his ascension, his life on earth is over. The price is paid. The victory is won. And death itself has been defeated. You want to put out a cool post on social media today? We win. The price is paid. The victory is won. Death itself has been defeated. Yeah, that's the good news. Jesus did many other things as well. But if every one of them were written down, this is what we see in John chapter 21, verse 25. Let's pull it up and look at it. John 21. John chapter 21, verse 25. There's so many things. This is what uh, John is going to tell us here. John chapter 21, verse 25. He says, Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. And if every one of them were to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So there's plenty, plenty of other key events in Jesus' life. But this is what we get from Scripture. This is sufficient. Okay, now. I told you guys at the beginning of this that when we got to the end of the show today, I would be asking a question. Here it is, folks, the question. If you will uh, send an email to Summer, I'll give you the email address in a moment, and you'll answer the question that I'm about to ask. We're going to send you one of these, FOC, that means free of charge. We will pay the shipping and get it to you. Uh, the only stipulation is that... Uh, We've got, to be, uh, we've got to be in a place where I can actually mail it to you. All right. Some places in Africa won't allow religious materials to be sent in. Uh, at the moment, for whatever reason, some places in the world are prohibitively expensive to ship to. But I, if, if, we'll, we'll, if you're inside the United States, if you're in, in Canada, perhaps uh, some, some spots in Europe we can, we can ship to now. We'll do our best to get this to you. Answer this question. And so this comes from earlier on in the presentation. Here's the question. What is the theological term we learned today for Jesus having two natures, fully God and fully man? What is that theological term? That's not it. That's not the term. But what is that theological term that we learn for Jesus' two natures? Now, if you will email that answer, the, the theological term, we learn today for Jesus' two natures, fully God and fully man, email that answer to summer at armoroftruth.net. Email that answer there, and the first correct answer we get uh, if you're the winner, we will contact you and ask for your mailing address, and we'll send you out this, this book. So email your answer to the question, what is the theological term we use for Jesus' two natures, fully God and fully man? What is that term we defined today? Send your answer to summer at armoroftruth.net as fast as you can. The first correct answer will, will win... Putting on the Armor by Chuck Lawless. Right there. 
Thanks once again to ChristianBook.com for making that possible. Okay, my friends, that is part one of Who is Jesus? Now, that's a lot of stuff, but the first episode, or the first study in these Bible study series, is, it's not really a Bible study, this is a Christology, right? A Christology. We're going we're gonna to know who is Jesus. Who is the Savior? And we're going to be using the Gospel of John as, as, as a template for that process. And we'll use uh, the events described by John uh, to, because there's, there are like, uh, what is it? I think 27 dialogues that Jesus has with, with, with either his disciples or, 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 his, or his enemies, those who are opposing him. We get a lot from Jesus in the Gospel of John. So this is a great way to learn about who he is, who he really is, who did he say he was, and what is our relation to him. So I want to say uh, thanks to all of you who are, have been hanging out with us today. It's been a, I've been looking at the I've been looking at the 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 viewer amount numbers as we've been going through here today. And it, I don't know what's going on with the YouTube platform, but at one moment it said we had ninety nine viewers and then it was down to forty. Who knows? I'm glad if one of you shows up here, that makes me happy. I'll talk to one of you. But uh, it's good to see you out there. Delta Jungle is with us. Nana P is with us. Thanks for being out there. There's John Wayne, of course, as usual. God, God bless, bless John, John Wayne. Wayne. Of course. Uh, Emma Peel. Leslie Mars. Emma Peel's throwing a term out there. That's the wrong term. The term we're looking for is, what is that term for Jesus' two natures? Fully God and fully man. Don't put it in the chat. You gotta email it. You gotta email it to summer at armoroftruth.net. The first correct answer. We'll get the book. Uh, Leslie Mars is out there with us. Good to see you. The lovely summer is in the chat with you, of course. She's gonna be manning the email as well to get that winner. Kelly Henson is good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for that uh, that card. That wedding card. Appreciate that. Bob D is in the house. Thanks for being here, man. CJM, there you are. Eddie Cassidy, check my liked videos, is with us today. All right, folks. So, part one. Of who is Jesus? Now, we don't know yet how many, how many parts this series is going to have because, listen, the Gospel of John is, it's huge. You, uh, to do an ex an expository <laughs> uh, study through. All you know, twenty, what is it? Twenty-one chapters of Gospel of John. It's just, it's just too rich. So we're going to break it down into the main events that we see. And there's a video. There's actually a. Uh, I want to share this with you while I'm thinking about it right now. Uh, you can find this for free. You can find it on YouTube. It's on Amazon uh, Video. And it's a it's a movie. Uh, there's a playlist on this channel, also that that has the, the movie listed, but it's right here. This movie right here, the Gospel of John. Now this is going to be uh, it's gonna it'll take you right from uh, chapter one, verse one. Right through the end of chapter 21. And you know, sometimes we can see these movies that are, I don't know, sometimes they don't turn out so well. This one is one of the best you'll ever see. Ah, it's better. Ah, yeah, it's better. Better than The Passion of the Christ. Some 
Passion of the Christ has some has some some strange some strange Gnostic ideas in it. This is just a straightforward pre- presentation of the Gospel of John, verse by verse, in movie form. One of the best you'll find. Some of you, most of you, probably seen this already, but I wanted to make sure you guys. I want to make that recommendation while we were here today. Since we're going to be going through it, the Gospel of John and learning. Who is our Savior? Who is Jesus? We want a high Christology. Okay, my friends, that's going to do it for today. I do appreciate all of you being here with us today. If you would like to support the work we're doing, we certainly do have some interesting things for you coming up very soon. And if you'd like to support what we're doing here, you can find links in the description to do that. There's a PayPal link. We have a Patreon account as well. And you can just use the Streamlabs donation link if you like. Uh, We need your help. We need your help more than ever. We uh, really appreciate the prayers and support, all the encouragement uh, you guys send us. It's many times it's overwhelming to hear some of the some of the the nice emails letters that people send in that are you know back here you can see them behind me back there hang them up on the wall hang them up on the the air conditioner back there and it's amazing uh, what some of you folks write in to tell us that uh, what your experience has been what the the channel what the work here on this channel has meant to you Uh, we get messages like that quite a bit and it's amazing I can't imagine you know this is just this is just me fulfilling what I feel like my calling is and for, for people to actually experience it and, and have, and have a, a, a positive result is, well, it's, that's all, that's all, that, that's a blessing. So I just want to thank you all for, for making it possible and for showing up here with us, whether it's a small crowd or a large crowd, I don't, it doesn't matter. I'll talk to you. I look forward to doing this again with you next Thursday. Probably at the same time, around 6 p.m. That seems to do a little, a little better. And the next time we'll be on the air here, uh, Lord willing, should be on uh, Tuesday for uh, Armor of Truth Live, if we don't see you before. But the next schedule is Tuesday. And who knows? We're going to try to keep the channel alive, okay? We just... For those of you who don't know, we were just on a week-long hiatus. YouTube sent us home, sat us down, put us in the corner, put us in YouTube jail for a week. Not even really sure what for. They don't tell you exactly why. Doesn't really matter. So uh, please check us out over on Odyssey. Probably the best place. Rumble. Rumble's all right, I guess. I don't know too much about Rumble. But we're on Odyssey. You can find these. uh, The videos that you can't see here on YouTube anymore, some of them that have been removed, some of them them YouTube took down, some of them I took off to avoid more strikes. Uh, The video we did on True Normal TV the other night didn't even last 24 hours. I guess a little too much. I don't know. Too spicy. Whatever. So check us out in all these other places, folks. Uh, Thank you for being with us. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for your prayers and support. We'll see you again next time. Armor of Truth, live. Faith is resistance.